My name is Tamar Thompson, and I serve as the head of corporate affairs for Lexion. We focus on transforming the lives of patients and families living with rare diseases and devastating conditions. I want to first thank Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson and Congressman Sanford Bishop for hosting this important session and for their dedication to providing a voice for our nation's service members of African descent. Alexion commends President Biden's focus on identifying ways to close the health equity gap that impacts communities of color and our veterans, as well as patients with rare diseases. One thing rare disease patients have in common with communities of color is that both are often underserved, underrepresented, and underwhelmed with the health care that they receive. For example, people with rare diseases frequently face complex journeys to receive a diagnosis. On average, it takes nearly five years and visits with more than seven specialists just to receive an accurate diagnosis. This is particularly relevant here today because there are certain rare diseases that have a higher incidence rate amongst the veteran population. And while the COVID pandemic has exposed many to the inequities that exist within our healthcare system, those disparities are not new. As we look forward, Alexion is actively supporting the administration's goals of more comprehensively identifying areas where healthcare disparities may be negatively impacting health outcomes and supporting solutions to improve those outcomes. For example, Alexion is setting goals around clinical trial diversity in order to move the needle forward in that area. We believe a critical factor in addressing inequities in the healthcare system is to foster a culture of diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Alexion is committed to building an inclusive environment where people belong because of their uniqueness. And we recognize that nurturing the diverse perspectives and strengths of our people translates into innovative breakthroughs for patients. This includes our Veteran and Allies in Service Council, a group of veterans and allies within Alexion that are working together to improve the health, well-being, and opportunities for veterans, and hope to elevate Alexion as a workplace of choice for veterans along the way. Along these same lines, we recognize that every patient is also on a particular health odyssey that has its own unique challenges. And we believe understanding each person's unique set of circumstances allows us to achieve better scientific results and ultimately helps us to create a meaningful value in all that we do to help patients and families live their best lives. To achieve these improved outcomes for patients, we must work together. Collaboration across the healthcare continuum will help to identify and break down barriers in order to build effective solutions to support better health for all citizens, including the most vulnerable. We look forward to furthering our partnership with the Biden administration and members of the Congressional Black Caucus to drive a more inclusive and equitable healthcare system that spurs innovative breakthroughs for all. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Congressman Sanford Bishop from Georgia's 2nd Congressional District. On behalf of my good friend and co-chair, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson from the 30th District of Texas, we'd like to welcome you to the 33rd Annual Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's Veterans Brain Trust. First, we would like to thank the 3rd United States Infantry Regiment, the Old Guard, for that inspirational posting of the colors, which pays tribute to all those who have served in our armed forces, both past and present. We have an exciting program for you today, 
that picks up right where we left off last year. This year, Congresswoman Johnson and I thought it would be valuable for you to hear directly from two of President Biden's top officials, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Secretary of Veterans Affairs Dennis McDonough. We wanted to hear from them on their plans to assist the African-American military and veterans communities move past COVID-19 and into a brighter future. We also will have a distinguished panel to discuss the Biden administration's plans for benefits, healthcare, and economic opportunities for our African-American veterans. I hope you'll stay on and listen to our entire program. But first, please join me for our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, as well as the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. They will be rendered by Rachel Webb, a talented young vocalist from the Dallas, Texas area. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the well for that lovely rendition of our national anthem and lift every voice and sing. Miss Webb was born and reared in DeSoto, Texas in my district and she is making our community proud every day. So I'm delighted that she could join us today. At this time I'd like to introduce another North Texan, Mr. Robert Johnson from the Veterans for Christ Corporation for an opening prayer. Mr. Johnson is a United States Marines veteran who founded the Veterans for Christ Corporation to help teach, 
transitioning soldiers about military benefits, family life, and spiritual advising. He also sits on my Veterans Advisory Committee and has been a strong advocate for veterans in North Texas. So Mr. Johnson, thank you again for joining us at this time. You're recognized for your invocation. I am so humbled to be here. I am also requesting all clergy to join me in praying for God's presence and blessing on our meeting. Would everyone please bow your heads. Father, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here because of you. Thank you for allowing this meeting in care of your servant leaders that are present. Jesus, I humbly ask for thy presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit with this occasion that brings us together. Lord, our veterans have given so much for our freedom. Please, if you're willing, Remember those who have sacrificed so much but are living in deplorable conditions. Father, send your Holy Spirit upon those dear ones, wherever they may be. Please give those dealing with depression the comfort and love of thy tender mercy. Raise up the broken to profess that you are God that heals the uttermost from the guttermost. Now, Father, as we are now in your presence, this is your altar. And I call on the name of Jesus to bring down fire from heaven to ignite what will start today. I pray that our words, our deeds will be pleasing to you. Father, I ask that you bless all of us as we serve our veterans and the United States of America. Jesus, in your precious and holy name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for that inspiring and uplifting prayer. As I mentioned earlier, this year marks the 33rd year of the Veterans Brain Trust and the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Congressional Black Caucus, started by former Congressman Charles Rangel of New York in 1971. Each year until 2020, veterans from across the country have convened in Washington to discuss the challenges facing African-American veterans. In recent years, we've had discussions regarding African-American veterans and the VA health system, the racial disparities in the healthcare delivery, ending homelessness among veterans, female veterans issues, and the challenges faced by our returning veterans from Vietnam and Afghanistan. Last year, we were joined by Dr. Anthony Fauci, former U.S. Attorney, uh, Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams, former U.S. Army Surgeon General Nadia West, as well as a distinguished panel to discuss COVID-19 and its impact on the African-American veterans community. We also have highlighted the contributions of African-American veterans throughout our nation's history. So I'm sure many of you watching today are aware African-American contributions to our military have often been overlooked and forgotten due to racism and the prejudices over the years. And we've brought together diverse groups of individuals from veteran service organizations, from colleges, universities, grassroots organizations, and elected and appointed officials on how to effectuate the change necessary to improve the lives of our African-American veterans community. I know that I can speak for my co-host, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, in saying that we both wish that we could have welcomed you in person. As long as I can remember, we've gathered at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center each September for our Veterans Brain Trust. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, however, this year marks the second year we've held our annual Veterans Brain Trust virtually. While we continue to miss the personal interactions and the fellowship, we must stay safe and defeat the scourge so that we can return our lives to some sense of normalcy. That brings me to the topic of this year's CBCF Veterans Brain Trust. 
the Biden administration, a new chapter for African-American veterans after COVID. You will hear shortly from Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Dennis McDonough, and a distinguished panel of experts from the VA on the efforts of the Biden administration to address the impact of COVID-19 and the impact that it's had on the African-American veterans community. We know already that African-Americans have been disproportionately effect, affected by the pandemic, or they've suffered more deaths, more joblessness, um, and have had less access to resources. A July 2021 report from the National Center on Health Statistics found that African-Americans saw a decrease in their life expectancy of 2.9 years during the pandemic. White Americans experienced the smallest decline of 1.2 years. When these inequities are considered alongside those of another vulnerable group, our veterans, the picture becomes even bleaker. Earlier this year, African-American service members accounted for 16% of COVID-19 cases in the VA system and 22% of deaths, despite the fact that they comprise only 12% of the overall veteran population in the United States. In addition, the veteran unemployment rate rose from 3.1% in 2019 to 11.7% in 2020, with African-American veterans experiencing even higher rates than white veterans. There have also been higher rates of mental health issues, housing concerns, financial need, food insecurity, and childcare issues, which the pandemic has exacerbated. Since we met in September of 2020, however, our country has made major strides in the fight against COVID-19. The gains we've made, however, are still tenuous. At the time of this recording, the more contagious Delta variant has become the most prevalent strain of COVID-19 in the United States. In addition, millions of Americans remain unvaccinated and unprotected, placing themselves and their families and communities at risk of infection, hospitalization, and even death. The good news is that our vaccinations, especially the Pfizer and Moderna, Moderna vaccines have, have been shown to be highly effective against the Delta variant. By and large, fully vaccinated individuals have not experienced the adverse symptoms that many associate with COVID-19. In fact, most COVID-19 hospitalizations and deaths in the United States have been unvaccinated individuals. As someone who has received both doses of the Pfizer vaccine, I strongly encourage you to protect yourselves and your loved ones and get vaccinated. In fact, I've been pleased to learn that under the Biden administration, the Department of Defense, and the Veterans Affairs Department have made it a top priority to ensure that service members and veterans of color have access to the vaccine, given the disproportionate risk that they face. I'm also pleased that the VA will mandate that 115,000 of its frontline healthcare workers will be vaccinated against COVID-19 in the next two months. As Vice Chair of the House Military Construction Veterans Affairs Appropriations Subcommittee, I'm pleased to report that we propose significant increases for the VA for the upcoming fiscal year to address unmet needs in veterans' health care, mental health services, rural health programs, homeless assistance, and initiatives to improve the processing of disability claims. I'm also pleased to co-sponsor the bipartisan Veterans Economic Recovery Act, which requires the VA to implement a program to provide up to 12 months of non-transferable retraining assistance to 35,000 veterans who are unemployed due to the pandemic for training assistance for high demand occupations. Finally, as the co-chair of the Congressional Military Family Caucus, I've introduced groundbreaking legislation entitled the EARN Act, E-A-R-N, to address the serious issue facing our servicemen and women of all backgrounds, namely food insecurity. This legislation will ensure that our military families 
have access to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program in a timely and effective manner so that they won't have to worry about putting food on the table. Okay, thank you for listening. And now I'd like to yield to my co-chair of the CBC Foundation's Veterans Brain Trust, a retired career VA registered nurse, the chairwoman of the House Science Committee, and my friend and classmate of longstanding, Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson of Texas. Well, thank you very much, Congressman Bishop, uh, for that gracious introduction. Uh, I just want everyone to know that this is my very esteemed colleague and to also say that although I can advocate, he is the one I have to go to to get the money. And so I have to stay in good with him. <laughs> I am honored to be with you today. And though I've always been an active participant in the Brain Trust, this is my first year as a co-host. Each year, the Veterans Brain Trust is an opportunity for African-American veterans across the country to come together to discuss the most pressing issues they're facing. In the past, we've explored topics ranging from higher education and employment, job training, and small business development to women and family support and, and much more too. And each year we come out more informed and better prepared to address these issues. So I look forward to continuing this tradition today. Though this year's theme is a little different. The Biden administration, a new chapter for African-American veterans after COVID-19. We will take a closer look at the care and benefits available to veterans as we face and after we have faced COVID-19 pandemic. As a former chief psychiatric nurse at the Dallas VA hospital, I have seen firsthand the challenges that veterans face every day trying to access quality affordable healthcare. And that facility is in my district now. Now, as a granddaughter, daughter, niece, wife and sister of veterans, I have always seen firsthand the toll that the lack of access to healthcare takes on veterans and their families. As Congresswoman Bishop pointed out, the challenge into assessing care and benefits and the tolls that they take on our veterans have been greatly exacerbated as, as a result of this pandemic. Um, and we all have heard about it, we all know about it, and we know that the hype and tension along with the questions have caused us to get a lot more attention from our veterans. According to the Department of Veterans Affairs, there has been over 270,000 cases of COVID-19 among veterans being treated at VA medical facilities. It is now up to us to make sure that as these veterans recover from COVID-19, they have and are made aware of every resource and benefit available to assist them. I believe that we can use this pandemic as an opportunity to start anew, to rebuild the foundation of our current system in a way that leaves no veteran behind. There's not an easy test. We know that everything we try to do with a diverse group of veterans, it takes time. But I'm confident that the Biden administration is doing all that they can do to provide veterans the world-class care and benefits they have earned and been promised. Most importantly, this includes making sure that veterans get vaccinated. I'm encouraged to see that over 500,000 American veterans have received their vaccines, but we must get that number a bit higher. We can do that by continuing, by continuing to educate about the vaccine and the advocating its safety and effectiveness. 
because it truly has shown that it saves lives. That's why I am proud to see that the Bipartisan Save Lives Act passed in Congress with my full support and be signed into law by President Biden. This bill allows the VA to provide COVID vaccine services to all veterans, veteran spouses, caregivers to the extent that they are available. So be sure to encourage all of our veterans to take advantage of this. It is among the many pieces of legislation that President Biden has already signed and that support our veterans and their families. I look forward to hearing from our keynote speakers, the distinguished secretaries of defense and of veteran affairs. And I look forward to having a productive discussion with our panelists about their experiences with veterans care. And don't be hesitant to say what we need to still be doing to make sure that all of our veterans have access to our promise. And now I'll turn back over to Congressman Bishop, the distinguished keynote, who will introduce the distinguished keynote speaker. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Congresswoman Johnson. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce the 28th Secretary of Defense, the first African-American to hold this important position, retired General Lloyd James Austin III. Secretary Austin is no stranger to us. He's been gracious enough to appear at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's Veterans Brain Trust in the past, most recently when he was commander of Central Command, CITCOM, which oversees all United States troops deployed in major United States military operations in the Middle East, Central Asia, and some parts of South Asia. Prior to leading CENTCOM as its first African-American commander, Secretary Austin was the 33rd Vice Chief of Staff of the Army from January 2012 to March 2013, and the last Commanding General of the United States Forces, Iraq Operation New Dawn, which ended December 2011. Secretary Austin has a long and distinguished resume. I would be remiss, however, if I did not mention that he was raised in Thomasville, Georgia, which at various times was in my congressional district. Secretary Austin is a great American and a patriot who has served our country with honor and distinction. Take it away, Mr. Secretary, sir. It is great to be back with the Veterans Brain Trust of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, especially as you celebrate the CBC's 50th anniversary. And let me thank my good friend, Congressman San Sanford Bishop, for this kind invitation. You know, I am a son of South Georgia, and I count myself lucky to have grown up in Thomasville, a place that Congressman Bishop knows very, very well. I'd also like to thank Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson, she spent a lifetime advocating on behalf of our nation's veterans. And thanks to everyone for tuning in today and for giving me the chance to talk about our priorities at the Department of Defense. Our number one job is to defend this nation and to keep Americans safe. And to do that, we must develop the right people, the right priorities and purpose of mission to take on any threat. You know, one of those threats is COVID-19. The pandemic has hit African-Americans especially hard. And service members of all backgrounds have had to deal with illness and loss and strain. But thankfully, we now have vaccines. And they're safe. They're effective. And they provide an extraordinary defense against serious disease, hospitalization, and death. The word has gotten out among my fellow African-American veterans. In fact, according to the VA, we have the highest vaccination rate compared to our Hispanic and white counterparts. And last month, I directed our military departments to immediately begin full vaccination of all service members on active duty or in the ready reserve using life-saving vaccines with full FDA licensing. 
Before making this decision, I consulted with top medical experts and leading scientists in our own service leadership and the president. And I also thought about my time commanding troops in Iraq. You know, back then I fought hard to make sure that my soldiers had the body armor that they needed in combat. I'm following that same principle now. We're gonna to come together to finish the job, urgently, professionally, and compassionately. It's essential to our national security and to defend the American people. We still have plenty of work to do to defeat COVID-19, but I'm also looking to the challenges of the future to ensure that we continue to have the very best fighting force on Earth. And we can't do that unless we're attracting and retaining the best possible talent from every American, everywhere. And so that means building diversity and equity and inclusion into everything we do. You know, when I was a young cadet at West Point, my plan was to serve for five years in the Army and, and then get out and go to law school. But you know, I quickly learned that I loved being a soldier. I loved leading soldiers and I loved serving my country. So instead of five years in uniform, I spent 41. And I don't regret a minute of it. And I want people to have that, that same experience within the U.S. military, to find a job that they love and to contribute their talents and skills and to keep our nation safe. But right now, there aren't always clear pathways for black Americans or people of color to advance up through the ranks. And when we do get promoted, we often look around a room of decision makers and we realize that we're the only person of color there. So here are a few things that I'm working on to make sure that the Defense Department can draw strength from service members from a diversity of backgrounds and experiences. First, we're expanding our efforts to recruit and retain top talent. For just one example, we have a program called Taking the Pentagon to the People, which helps students and faculty and others at HBCUs learn about careers within the Department of Defense. I've also asked my team to come up with new strategies and solutions. We can't do our best if we're afraid to listen to new ideas from people who haven't always had the chance to put their vision forward and to be treated with dignity and respect while they do it. I also want to make sure that our military officers better reflect the diversity of this nation because we need the strongest possible force. And we've got to take care of all of our people and to grow and develop the talent that we need for the future and to ensure that everyone who serves can do so in an environment free of hate and harassment and discrimination. Thank you again for your tremendous work. I appreciate your support and I appreciate your leadership. And I appreciate everything that you do for our men and women in uniform and for our nation's veterans. At this time, it is my honor to welcome our second distinguished keynote speaker, Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Dennis McDowell. Secretary McDowell, was nominated by President Biden to serve as Secretary of the VA and was sworn in on February the 9th, 2021. He has previously served in the Obama administration. That's when I met him. As the Chief White House, excuse me, as the White House Chief of Staff, the Principal Deputy National Security Advisor and Chair of the National Security Council. Debitus Committee, among several other security related roles. I have been in his presence in and outside this country. Uh, in these capacities, he has helped shape the Obama administration's work and on behalf of military families and veterans. He's also held several senior leadership and policy making uh, staff positions in, in Congress and has contributed to the passage of legislation that will benefit our military and veterans for generations to come. And so with all that said, I am now proud 
to introduce Secretary McDonald. Thank you, Congresswoman Johnson, for that kind introduction and for your bold leadership during 27 years of public service in the House of Representatives. It is an honor to speak with you today. I've watched the CBC in action for a long time and got to work with the first CBC member who moved to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. I've seen up close the ethos and the work of the Congressional Black Caucus. I've witnessed the intergenerational fight for equality and equity for black people in America, and how you do that work so well. For 50 years, you have fought to bridge the divide caused by segregation, racism, and discrimination. And for 50 years, the CBC's rich history of service has broken down many barriers for all Americans, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or creed. Here at VA and in America, we owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude for that work. And we are so proud to be your partners in executing it. Thank you so much for all you do. Importantly, your work is as relevant today as when it began. Because when we find ourselves struggling still with the same issues of racism, bigotry, and hate, we know we need your leadership. As John Lewis said so well, the scars and stains of racism are still deeply embedded in American society. That truth was laid bare by 2020 that none of us will ever forget. 2020 was the year that George Floyd was murdered. The year hate crimes rose across the nation, especially against Asian Americans. And the year that a global pandemic that has killed hundreds of thousands of Americans began, with people of color dying at far greater rates than white people. The statistics tell the terrible story. African Americans have been almost one and a half times more likely to get COVID-19 and nearly three times more likely to die from it. These disparities are tragic. They are unacceptable. And they have brought into even sharper focus and more painful focus the disturbing effects of racial biases and stereotypes on the quality of health and health care people of color endure. Now, these disparities have festered since our nation's founding. So nobody is under any illusions that ending them will be easy. Righting these wrongs will require all of us pulling in the same direction at the same time to drive change. But make no mistake, we can and must do it. President Biden appointed me to lead VA with a clear mission to be a fierce, staunch advocate for veterans and their families. When he did that, he wasn't talking about some veterans. He charged me to care for all veterans, for black veterans, their families, survivors, and caregivers. With your help, that's exactly what we're doing at VA. And in just a few months, we've already made real progress. First, as soon as I got to VA, I created an Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access Task Force charged with weaving those specific principles into the fabric of our mission. They are making sure that all veterans, especially black veterans, have timely access to their VA resources. That's world-class health care, that's earned benefits, and it's a dignified final resting place that's a lasting tribute to their service. They've already made real progress toward those goals and we'll have more to report on that very soon. Second, we are working to address racial disparities in COVID care, especially by getting shots in the arms of every black veteran, their families, and their caregivers. In fact, our Office of Research and Development funded a study to address COVID-related health disparities and improve access to key COVID research trials. In the study, we learned that, frankly, there is a mistrust of all institutions, including VA, because of historical wrongs. That's why every day we go to work and in every piece of COVID communication we send, we are focused on rebuilding that trust. To that end, we got thousands of black veterans into the initial COVID-19 vaccine trials. 
and we've now successfully vaccinated over 638,000 black vets. That's 59% of all the black veterans in our VA healthcare system. And our average healthcare trust scores among black vets since March of this year is 91%. And let me just say this to everyone watching. If you haven't been vaccinated already, please, please, please do so. I can't repeat this enough. 99% of those dying from COVID right now are unvaccinated. In other words, almost every COVID death from this day forward is preventable. The vaccine can save your life, protect your families, and protect our veterans. Please get it. Third, and perhaps most importantly, we are focused on creating a workforce that looks like America. Not only because that's the right thing to do, but because it can save lives. This is perhaps most clear when you look at the tragic case of racial disparities in newborn deaths. Black newborns are three times as likely to die as white newborns, which is itself a horrific encapsulation of the systemic racism of our nation's healthcare system. But a recent study found that this crisis can be addressed in the simplest of ways. Hire black doctors to take care of black babies. The study showed that when the doctor of record for black newborns was also black, the baby's mortality rate was cut in half. This is true for adults too. A similar study showed that black doctors treating black men could reduce the black-white gap in cardiovascular disease mortality by 19%. In other words, if our country has doctors and caregivers who look like the population they serve, we can save the life of a newborn, of a friend, of a father or mother, brother or sister. And in so many cases, we can save the life of a veteran who fought for our country. That's why we are working with more than 200 minority serving institutions to train, manage, and develop a future healthcare workforce that looks like America. Now, there's so much more I could say here, but it all boils down to this. For too long, too many black veterans who fought around the world to protect our rights and freedoms, my rights and freedoms, have had to fight brutal battles here at home for their own rights and freedoms. Tragically, many of those fights continue to this day. But my promise to you and to black veterans everywhere is that at VA, those fights are over because black vets have fought more than enough for our country. They shouldn't ever have to fight for the benefits, care, and services that are rightfully theirs. But make no mistake, we can't do that work without you. We couldn't do it without the deep devotion and advocacy of the veterans in your caucus, Congressman Sanford Bishop, Congressman Bobby Rush, Congressman Bobby Scott, Congressman G.K. Butterfield, and combat veteran and Congressman Anthony Brown, or without any of the great leaders at CBC. Because when you advocate for black veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors, you make us better. And when you speak on the behalf of black veterans, I know that you're speaking with your voices and with voices other than just your own. You speak with the voices of African Americans who have fought for our nation in the revolution helping the militia and Continental Army secure America's independence. The voices of the segregated 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, who fought heroically during the Civil War to preserve this union, abolish slavery, and heal the country. The voices of the million African Americans who fought courageously in World War II to turn the tide of tyranny. And the voices of the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion, the only black women's army corps unit deployed to Europe in World War II. For that reason, and so many more, I promise that when you speak, we at VA are going to listen. And in doing so, we are going to serve black veterans and all veterans every bit as well as they have served us. Thank you so much for all you do and all you have done to make us better. God bless you. God bless our nation's troops, our veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors. It's the honor of a lifetime to partner with you in making sure we always give you our very best.
Thank you. Thank you. It is an honor for me to be here today with Representative Johnson to introduce this distinguished panel that will discuss the Biden administration's plans for African-American veterans post COVID-19. Our next panelist is Dr. Stephen Holt. Dr. Holt was appointed the director of the VA North Texas Healthcare System on December 10th, 2017, where he leads the second largest VA system in the nation. VA North Texas includes facilities in Dallas, Bonham, Fort Worth, Tyler, Plano, and five community-based outpatient clinics throughout its 40 county service area. Dr. Holt oversees a nearly $1 billion annual operating budget, 5,600 staff, and 1,500 volunteers. It is a pleasure to welcome him to the panel today. Our third panelist is Cheryl Rawls. Ms. Rawls was appointed as Executive Director for Outreach, Transition, and Economic Development at the Veterans Benefits Administration last April. She is responsible for department-wide veteran and family-centric outreach and direct services, community stakeholder engagement, and veteran service recovery programs throughout the Veterans Benefit Administration's four districts and 56 regional offices. She has oversight of VA's transition assistance program at over 300 installations worldwide for active duty, reservists, and National Guard personnel across all branches of the service, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard. Welcome, Ms. Rawls. Finally, I want to welcome a friend and fellow Georgian, Charles Coney Dobbins. Coney was elected and installed as the Veterans of Foreign Wars Department of Georgia State Commander at the 76th annual convention held in Macon, Georgia in June 2018. He ended his assignment as state commander on June 30th, 2019 as an all-American state commander. Past state commander Dobbins spent more than 20 years on active duty in the United States Army from November 1974 to May of 1995, excuse me. Thanks for being here with us today, Tony. The next question is for Dr. Holt. Can you tell the viewers today about your experiences managing the second largest VA system in the nation during the pandemic? What have you seen in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on the African-American veterans population in terms of their physical and mental health? Have you seen an influx of veterans recently due to the Delta variant? Thank you very much for that question. Let me begin um, just with a global answer and say, you know, the VA as America's healthcare system is as strong as it is thanks to the incredibly aggressive oversight of Congress. Uh, we have managed to come a long way because of practical interest in ensuring that we perform very well. Globally, um, African-Americans, as far as COVID vaccine goes in the VA, uh, lead the way with only one group, Asian-Americans, having a higher vaccination rate than African-Americans. Unfortunately, though, here in Texas, because of the strong anti-vaccine campaigns and things and misinformation, we can't say the same. We, our, my African-American uh, fellow disabled American veterans uh, are a few percentage points behind in terms of vaccination. And penetrating into the community to build that trust to get people in to get the, that vaccine, which is so critically important, to protect them. Never have we had vaccines with this degree of efficacy before, uh, this degree of safety. It's been hard to get that message out there, even though my medical center is very close in many respects to my major African-American population that I serve. And by contrast, I'm going to say I've had 99, the last data check I did, I've had 99 African-Americans admitted with COVID compared to 91 Caucasians. African-Americans only make up 24% of my patient population versus 60% for Caucasians. So the good news is it looks like they're using my services. The bad news is we're seeing a lot more COVID than we should be expecting to see based on the, the population at hand. 
And now that the Delta variant is taking off, I'm really, really concerned about this because in my staff, 83% of my staff is vaccinated. These are the insiders, they, the inside traders. They know what needs to be done. Among my veterans, it's only 35%. And again, I think that's the effect of the strong in vax policies and other policies in, in this region that's seriously affecting. And we need help to get that message out to, to be able to ensure that we're providing services timely. Now, the other part of that, as you all know, there, there is some disparities in healthcare. And as you research that, the good news is the magnitude of those disparities for African Americans is much smaller for the VA. And again, I think this is because of the aggressive oversight and interest that Congress has had in ensuring the VA is a high performing healthcare system. Again, we, you know, we can never get enough assistance for this, and we truly really need a lot of systems to be able to get people in and get them vaccinated. This is so critical. In the Delta variant, right now, 99 plus percent of people who are dying of COVID are unvaccinated. And less than half a percent of people who've been vaccinated are dying from this Delta variant, which is now the predominant strain in the country. This is serious. We had this thing virtually lit, but now we're dealing with the pandemic, the unvaccinated. I hope that answers your question, sir. Many thanks, Dr. Hope, for that very insightful answer. Uh, Ms. Rawls, I want to turn our attention to the economic impact of the pandemic on veterans, especially the African-American veteran community. Can you discuss what the Biden administration is doing to provide economic opportunities for our veterans post-COVID-19? Uh, is there more that you think that Congress should be doing? Well, thank you very much, sir. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm excited about the invitation uh, and it's also an honor. So um, let's talk about the American Rescue Plan that provided $17 billion additional dollars to, to VA um, during this period. And what we did with that um, was a huge throughout all three administrations. Um, I want to talk about a few of those things, so and because I think they're they're the most foundational. So that relief um, was provided for veterans. Uh, we had two different types of moratoriums put into place. One, we stopped doing the, the debt collection. Um, two, in the loan guarantee area, we helped veterans to um, modify their loans so they could stay in their home, and and that was significant through uh, throughout the area. Um, we had the programs like um, rapid retraining assistance uh, that we put together uh, and, and implemented. And this is going to be instrumental in helping our veterans get connected to the new programs and jobs and energy, manufacturing and the infrastructure as uh, outlined in the American Jobs Plan. So we're, you see, we're trying to make sure that we stay integrated. Now, when we start talking about reaching out to our underserved populations and communities, sometimes VA has been the leader and sometimes we have been uh, just the participant. We've led the community in going into underserved populations and holding economic development um, initiatives in which we bring the community together and talk about those items that are prevalent. We bring um, job fairs to connect them. We help people file for their claims. And then the times when we're not so much leading, we are engaging in veterans um, action um, centers um, throughout the nation, which is basically community run. And I wanna put the emphasis on the community. And lastly, I wanna talk about the um, outreach that we've been doing. So during the pandemic, we engaged in over 400 minority-focused um, veteran outreach events that was here as well as around the world. And those events, um, over half of the participants, and I'm talking about 12,000, over half of them were um, African-Americans that, that attended. And so we've been trying to pinpoint that and make sure people had their information. Now, lastly, you asked, um, can we do more? And the answer is yes, we can do more. 
And the emphasis is on, at this time is on the community. Now, while VA has a trust score of over 79%, we know that the integration of state, federal, and community is paramount. But sometimes we don't spend as much time on recognizing our faith-based organizations or our community veteran service officers who are on the front lines, going door to door, and are in those communities. We have to make sure that our tools are provided for them because they are truly partners for us and that we give them the recognition that they have earned in taking care of this population. Uh, I hope you found that helpful, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Rawls, for, for your comments. Uh, let me turn uh, back to Ms. Britton. Um, can you say in a few words uh, about what impact uh, COVID-19 has had on the processing of VA benefits? Uh, what help is the VA under the Biden administration providing the veterans who are experiencing financial difficulties during the pandemic? And have you seen a disproportionate impact on African-American veterans? Thank you for this opportunity to speak on behalf of VA. With our flexible telework policy already in place at the onset of the pandemic, we seamlessly transitioned to a maximum telework environment, and we continue to provide benefits and services while ensuring the safety and well-being of both veterans and our employees. Although closed for in-person interviews, our regional offices remained open for the first time on a mass scale providing virtual interviews to veterans and their families as part of our public contact operations. In the past year, we've completed over 7,000 claims in a single day on 18 occasions, six, six of which occurred after the national emergency declaration. And on June 7th, I am happy to state that we completed our 1 millionth claim, which is the second fastest rate within a performance year. We also saw an uptake in the number of calls received in our national call center with an average speed to answer hitting historic lows. We were able to exceed previous year's performances, resulting in 5.2 million calls being answered in an average of 27 seconds with a 1.4% abandoned call rate, which includes 144 of 185 days of our calls being answered in less than 15 seconds. Despite a few operational obstacles, VBA continues to serve veterans during the pandemic at a level that honors their service. With the support of President Biden and Congress, VA has been able to offer additional education and training opportunities. As part of the American Rescue Plan of 2021, the Veteran Rapid Retraining Assistant Program, also known as VRAP, provides veterans who wouldn't otherwise be eligible for educational benefits with the funding for high demand occupations. This program provides nearly $400 million in retraining assistance for veterans who are unemployed due to COVID and do not have other veteran education benefits. We've also taken deliberate steps to provide financial relief during this period. For example, VA suspended collection of debts. And we also work closely with home loan lenders to extend forbearance and prevent foreclosures on veteran homes. We do not currently have any type of study that tracks the direct impact on COVID on American, better, um, African Americans, however, as part of the new equality services under the Biden administration, we are reviewing on a large scale potential impacts on the African-American community. With that said, we can never underestimate the power of knowledge and it being a major key to growth within the African-American community. An important part of the equation to increase in benefit and service utilization amongst African-Americans is educate, educate, educate. To assist with increasing awareness, each regional office has a minority veterans program service coordinator who is sole responsibility is to develop strategies and programs targeted to minorities. VBA also is partnered with the VA Center of Minority Veterans 
to develop a plan to evaluate and address the lower overall life satisfaction for African Americans based on what is known as the 2019 Post-Separation Transition Assistance Program. As Ms. Rawls indicated, our veteran service organizations are also located at each regional office and county VSOs are available within individual communities to serve as, as advocates for our veterans. We see our VSO partners as a gateway into interacting with VA. I encourage all veterans to use them as a trusted resource. We've also established faith-based outreach, which is a key outreach element to establishing and leveraging relationships within our community churches. In my previous role as the Assistant Director for the Baltimore Regional Office, I witnessed the power of this relationship and how it can help VA spread the word about VA benefits and services. But more importantly, how this relationship helps with educating veterans and lessening mistrust and skepticism among our African-American community. Last but not least, we implemented the VA Solid Start Program in December of 2019. This program not only not directed or tied to any race, takes a proactive approach to bridging the gap from transition to civilian life. We have a dedicated staff whose sole responsibility is to make three, three calls to service members within their first year of exiting the military. This dedicated staff provides direct support with all VA benefits and services and can help veterans connect with the appropriate benefits that meet their needs. Additionally, as part of this program, we provide priority contact to veterans who have had a mental health exam or appointment within their last year of active service. In acknowledging mental health as a tremendous impact on the African-American community and other communities at large, it is important that we have effective avenues in place to raise this topic to the surface for conversation. I encourage our African-American community and all service members to engage freely with their VS, VA Solid Start agents on mental health issues to increase the utilization of benefits and services. I hope that has provided you, sir, with some insight into what VA is doing um, to ensure that our services remain consistent through COVID, as well as ensuring that there is no impact on the African um, American community as we continue to deliver benefits to our service members. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Britton. Uh, those, those comments were very, very helpful. Uh, finally, I'd like to turn to Tony Dobbins, uh, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, Georgia State Adjutant. Mr. Dobbins, what's the VFW's perspective on what the Biden administration can do to help our nation's veterans and to provide them with economic opportunities as we hopefully emerge from this pandemic? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator, uh, or Representative uh, Bishop. I'm very uh, glad to be here this evening. Uh, the VA is currently comprised of three administrations, the National Cemetery Administration, the Veterans Benefit Administration, and the uh, Veterans Health Administration. VBA is in charge not only of compensation and pension, but also the GI Bill, Veterans Readiness and Employment, Housing and Business Loans, and the broadly defined Transition Assistance Program, which is shared with the Departments of Labor, Defense, and Homeland Security. The VFW believes our nation's focus on the economic opportunities of our veterans must be permanent. In reality, not all veterans seek VA health care when they are discharged. They do not need assistance from the NCA and they do not all seek disability compensation. However, the vast majority are looking for gainful employment and, and or uh, education. Congress should recognize the value of these programs by separating them into their own administration solely uh, based on utilization and growth. The VFW has long proposed that Congress create a fourth administration under VA with this undersecretary whose sole responsibility is the Economic Opportunity Program. This new undersecretary for economic opportunity would refocus resources, provide a champion for these programs 
and create that central point of contact to DSO and Congress. We urge Congress to introduce legislation that will establish a fourth administration of VA to oversee benefits and such as the GI Bill, Veterans Readiness and Employment, Home Loan and Economic Opportunity Center benefits. Many of these economic opportunity issues fall under DBA to administer. The VFW release DBA's organizational structure needs updating. These changes would allow the new fourth administration to utilize its own IT resources without sharing with compensation and pension. It would also allow the new undersecretary to focus these critical programs and expand access to all veterans, especially underserved veteran populations across this country. And that concludes my comments, sir. All right, thank you, Mr. Dobbins. Uh, we have about 10 or so minutes left, and I want to throw open for a few questions in the time that we have remaining. Uh, so be brief in your responses. Ms. Britton and Ms. Rawls, what, what have been the biggest casework issues that you've seen among veterans during the pandemic? Certainly, sir. Uh, the first single biggest issue has been vaccinations and exam completions. With African Americans across the U.S. having a low rate of vaccinations, I would like to highly encourage vaccinations and if they are scheduled for PMP exams, to please report to those exams. Those exams. Although we continue to hold claims where veterans do not feel safe reporting for the exam, we encourage veterans to exam to to report to those exams as soon as they feel comfortable doing so. Um, this is important for veterans to know and understand um, that the exam is a very critical component needed to complete the claims process. Ms. Rawls? Thank you very much. And as Ms. Britton said um, about vaccinations and exams, um, I just want to add to this uh, another layer uh, that has been impacting Black um, veterans. And that is being able to be affiliated with a veterans organization, you know, in their community to get uh, assistance and, and help. And we know that we like sometimes um, don't get all of the help that is out there. We have to lean in, but we do this a lot face to face. We like to talk to people. And so one of the things that, that, that the pandemic has done um, is not allowed us the face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. Uh, it has widened the gap for those who are not electronically inclined, um, many of our, our elderly. And when we look at our schools and our veterans who need assistance there, they have not been able to talk to their vet reps on campus. And so it's just been that disconnect that is continuing to widen that gap. So you can't get that information out there about getting the vaccination or getting to your exam that that is safe because we spread a lot of information by word of mouth. Thank you. Um, I'd like to throw this question open to the entire panel. Uh, Black veterans are substantially overrepresented among homeless veterans, comprising 39% of the total homeless population, but only 11% of the total veteran population. Can you elaborate on this topic and discuss the VA's efforts to properly transition our servicemen and women from the military into their civilian communities while ensuring that veterans are aware and provided the benefits that they deserve? Uh, Past Commander Dobbins, let's start with you. Uh, thank you, uh, sir. The best way to ensure success for transitioning service members is to make sure they fully utilize the transition assistance program channel. Education, employment, housing, healthcare, and benefits are all important aspects of a veteran's life, and those begin at the TAP classes. Making sure service members have a productive transition is a top VFW priority. We have service officers at 26 military installations assisting transition service members file for their care and benefits before leaving active duty. The best way to ensure success in transition is to make sure they, there aren't any gaps in care and benefits. And that's what our service officers do for them. Thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Holt. Yeah, you know, we're very fortunate that the VA undertook 
the elimination of, of homelessness, but we not achieved that goal. We have put a lot of resources. I have about 170 people servicing a little over 7,000 veterans in this North Texas area who range from at risk of homelessness to being out on the, out on the streets. And it's an effort that we have to continue to work. I mean, we're very fortunate to have the resources that have been given to us. We have made, I think, substantial progress, but it's still 7,000 of my veterans are at some level of risk. And, you know, again, what, what you're hearing from the other panelists as well, in order to really do well, we have to provide great health care, housing, and honor to meaningful employment. Unfortunately, VA is able to bring these together, but we've not solved the problem completely, and we're highly dependent on the partnerships we have with the community, like the VFW, for instance. And again, getting people in. The earlier we get these veterans into the system, the less it takes to get them back to a meaningful existence of safe, secure, safe, secure housing, health, and again, auto, meaningful employment. So this is a community effort. We so greatly appreciate the resources we've been given, and we so greatly appreciate the partnerships that we have with the various veteran service organizations, churches, and other groups that are just so interested in taking care of America's heroes. Let me throw this one out. Uh, I'd like to ask a question for the entire panel. What efforts uh, is, the, are the Biden, is the Biden administration taking to address uh, the issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, in the Veterans Administration. Uh, Ms. Britton, you want to comment on that? Yes, sir. So earlier in my testimony, not my testimony, but earlier in my speak, I did speak about um, how under the Biden administration, um, we have those new programs that we are looking at to really focus in and identify what impacts we see um, on the American, the African-American community. Um, so we partnered with the Biden administration, as well as our transitioning department held by, ran by Ms. Rawls, will continue to work with and under the Biden administration to really focus in on identifying some of those issues and then developing the necessary programs um, to align with those issues to get the best out of it. Um, as I said earlier, we do have our VRAP um, program, which is out there to really um, provide that educational assistance to our veterans. Um, so we will continue to leverage programs as that um, to continue to um, serve these veterans in a larger capacity. Um, Ms. Rawls, would you like to add? Um, absolutely, uh, and thank you very much. So uh, um, the 1st of April, uh, the Secretary of VA implemented a task force uh, on um, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access uh, in, within VA. And this spread across the, at all the administrations. I, I'm actually a member of that task force and we had 120 days um, to look through uh, this organization from top to bottom about um, what is going on and what can we do better with the intent of ensuring that anything that we work to put in place would become a part of the culture, that we would be conscious about um, taking action and the ideas would um, just permeate throughout. Uh, the department has been uh, involved, the higher echelons, we've gotten feedback uh, from employees and we actually went outside um, to private organizations to see how they were dealing with inclusion and equity um, and diversity and access. So we are looking forward to um, the report being released uh, in the near future and putting in place uh, the actions and activities that will build a stronger culture of diversity. And we want to be conscious about it. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, and I want to thank all of the exceptional panelists today for your insights into this important issue uh, and for all of the work that, that you're doing in support of African-American veterans uh, uh, in our nation. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so very, very much. This has been very, very good. And as we now come to the uh, closing of our brain trust, 
Representative Johnson and I would like to thank all of the distinguished participants in the panel, uh, Dr. Stephen Holt, uh, Cheryl Rawls, uh, Kenesha Britton, and Tony Dobbins. We want to thank you for being with us today. And I hope you'll stay in touch with my office and Representative Johnson's office uh, to see how we can work together in behalf of our nation's African-American veterans and find solutions to the pressing concerns uh, that, that we have. We also want to thank once again our keynote speakers, Secretary Austin and Secretary McDonough. I want to thank you for your thoughtful and timely remarks and for fighting the good fight every day to keep America safe and to assist our nation's veterans. We want to thank Rob Johnson for his uh, stirring invocation to start our proceedings today. And we want to thank the entire staff at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for their technical assistance in making this brain trust a reality. Congressman Johnson and I want to say thank you to our personal staffs and to the VA Congressional Liaison's Office, especially Anne Marie Amaral and Mandy Hartman for their very hard work in producing this year's Brain Trust. As we close, let us reaffirm and paraphrase the words of Abraham Lincoln, which have become the motto of the United States Veterans Administration, to care for him and her who shall have borne the battle. Thank you for your participation. God bless you and God bless America.